So we decided we would uh, finish up today with a, a speaker panel Q&A. You already know our speakers, Lou Rockwell, David Gordon, Justin Palatano, and Dr. Ron Paul. So we're very interested in your questions and thoughts. But uh, before we do so, I wanted to give a special thanks to two of our, our real hosts and hostess for the day. I don't know where they're seated. Gary and Nina Terpangian are, are sitting here. Um, They are, uh, <clears throat> they are, they're both uh, relatively, relative to some of our benefactors, relatively new to the Mises Institute, and we're affected by Ron Paul's uh, two campaigns, I know, and um, we're very generous in making today's event happen for us all. They live in the, uh, in the uh, Rancho Palos Verdes area, generally here, uh, well, not here, but in Los Angeles, and uh, we're very thankful to both of you, and uh, we're very glad you're part of the Mises Institute. So with that, we have these two young men with microphones. We ask that you speak into the mic, and we ask that you uh, uh, go with a question rather than a soliloquy. <laughs> uh, given the discussion and, and the optimism, and, and that's great, but uh, we got a long ways to go. So talking about the term government, most people think they seem to like that term, and then selling the concept liberty or freedom. If you go out in the street and talk to people, you've got freedom, my gosh, we can go anywhere in the world, buy any clothes we want. Apparently, we have a lot of freedom. It's just, is there some language changes here that we can make to propel our movement? Well, one of the things that I try and emphasize, perhaps to the type of audience that you're speaking of, is to ask them who owns their income, them or the government? Why is it the government gets their income at the same time they do, and why is the government gets to decide how much of their income they get to keep? And then you can make the same argument with their home. I mean, here in California, real estate taxes are about as oppressive as they are in New Jersey, so that should be relatively easy arguments to make. And then I sort of play off on something that I, I think Ron may have used before. It's actually a Murray Rothbard argument, and it's fairly effective. And that is, there are three ways to acquire uh, wealth. And one is by the sweat of your brow. And one is uh, because you were fortunate enough to inherit it. And the other is the mafia model, which is your property or else. And then I pause and say, which model does the government use? <laughs> Judge Napolitano, uh, this is a question I've been wanting to ask you for years. Are you in favor of having the goal being a stateless, voluntary society? And if not, why not? Am I in favor of what being a stateless society? Our society being stateless. The absence of any political state. Are you in favor of that or not? And if not, why not? Well, I would be in favor of that as the goal. I mean, I... Except when Walter Block is in the room. I'm the most libertarian person in the room. And, and ideally, I could probably protect my life, liberty, and property better than, than the government can. But that's an ideal, and, and that ideal is not going to come about, come about overnight. So I would be in favor of the incremental movement toward that ideal. Next question, this gentleman. Okay, this question is for the judge. Respectfully, go easy on me on your answer, please. Um, I'm, with regard to the threat of Ebola and your, your comment about the lady that was incarcerated unjustly, for sure, but there is a great risk. So where is the line between protecting her from getting on an airplane and spreading that risk versus her rights and her freedom? Well, in my world, there wouldn't be a TSA, and the government wouldn't decide who gets on the airlines. The airlines would, because they have the most to lose. And so if the owner of the plane decided he didn't want someone on that plane for whatever reason, the owner, American Airlines, United Airlines, Delta, whoever it might be, can make that decision. And then we wouldn't, we wouldn't reach the issue with Chris Christie locking her up uh, in a tent. But in the present world in which we live, we still, at least in theory, have the presumption of liberty. And the burden is always on the government to show why that presumption is lost. It never switches to the individual. Was that easy on you? Do 
Dr. Paul, in your talk, you mentioned, you said that I think we are all naturally libertarian and they beat it out of us. I thought that was great. Do you agree that elimination of corporal punishment of children is an important step to removing the conditioning of people to accept the violence of the state? Corporal punishment, punishing kids. Well, I don't happen to believe in it. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to have a policeman uh, who's going to be rounding up parents who might have slapped their kid on their bottom for doing something wrong. So uh, corporal p- punishment, I think, uh, unless a child is, is really injured, uh, needs to be ignored. Uh, but, uh, you know, to me that is minor. But uh, I I don't personally believe in it and didn't experience it. And, and I think, uh, of course, that's, that is the best society to have is to understand that it's not worth anything and it doesn't accomplish the goals. So, uh, I, I basically would aim to have no, uh, no corporal punishments, but, uh, there's, there's a limit to it. I mean, if kids are getting beat up and, and really injured, then, uh, somebody has to do something about it. Questions is for Ron Paul. Uh, Ron, you ran, you may recall, running for president in 2008. You got 5% of the vote. And uh, you may recall running, running in 2012, and you got 10% of the vote. Um, I'm looking forward to getting 20% of the vote in 2016. <laughs> so when are you going to announce? <laughs> I just wonder why, I wonder why you have against me. <laughs> Gentlemen, Dr. Paul, my name is Mac, and I live here in Temecula, and I've listened quite a bit to uh, your expounding and your development of the homeschool program, and I'm just curious, I've got a daughter who's 16, she's a little bit too late to the party, but uh, I'm just curious as to how you see over maybe the next 10, 15, 20 years the progression from uh, independent or homeschool learning away from state learning. Of course, I think the homeschooling movement is going to continue to grow. Uh, fortunately, in the 1980s, when they tried to close it down before it even uh, got going, uh, that there were some court rulings to protect it. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, as more evidence abounds about the failure of the government schools, I think you're going to see a lot more. Uh, I don't think we're on the verge of seeing uh, the majority of people being homeschooled. You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. And the homeschooling program that uh, I have with the help of Tom Woods and Gary North, uh, this program is doing quite well and it's growing uh, mainly by word of mouth. Uh, and it's designed not to uh, ever believe we're going to have 100% of the students. I mean, we're looking for people particularly interested in a certain type of education, and that is uh, based around the uh, freedom philosophy. So you know what kind of study on that history you're going to have, and you're going to have classics, and you're going to have an economic policy that's quite different, and you're going to have a foreign policy and it's not going to be taught by neocons. So uh, I think that you're going to see a lot more. I think our program is going to continue to grow. Grow, and uh, I think there'll be different programs emphasizing different things. Ours is going to emphasize emphasize liberty, which means that it should be in the defense of protecting anybody who wants to have any kind of a homeschooling program uh, would would be protected. But uh, I think the um, the failure of the public school system is going to be with us for a while. It's probably going to get much worse. Statistics, statistics right now are showing that uh, homeschooling is uh, much more successful than I ever dreamed. So I think it's going to be here for a while, and it's going to continue to grow. I'm sure there's quite a few central committee members here. Um, do you have any direct advice or insight uh, into the politics at the local level? Uh, just trying to help us out. Well, I think that uh, local level politics probably makes more sense than uh, some of the national politics um, because government should be much more local. And this is where I have been surprised because every day uh, we we meet people that were uh, brought into the freedom movement back in 08 and and I tell them to go do something, you know, whatever. And, and some of them, I don't know why they'd go into politics, but, <laughs> but they have and they've gotten elected. So there's a lot of local people, you know, involved. And, but I think whether you're in local government or national government, 
it has to be done with a precise goal. And it's when young people come to me in my office, they frequently say, you know, I want to, I understand what's going on and I want to be a congressman. And now what are you going to tell me? I says, don't set that as your goal. <laughs> you, you don't want it just to be in politics for the sake of politics, because that's why 99% of the people in Washington are involved in politics. Locally, I think that would be less so because you have to deal with uh, some real uh, important property rights. You know, uh, maybe somebody locally could wake up the people on the way they waste our money and uh, use eminent domain and taxes and property regulations and all these things. So I think I think that's worthwhile. Always with the goal of not saying, well, what do I have to do to please the majority who wants more government? and vote that way, but to uh, use it as a tool to influence people to believe precisely in the principle of property rights and uh, very limited government. I think everybody in this room can agree that inflation is theft on a grand scale, right? So why don't we start doing some kind of citizen's arrest of guys like Ben Bernanke? Well, he didn't you say my name, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, my, my suggestion is everybody goes back and reads the, the uh, Coinage Act of 1792. And, uh, you know, it, it, the uh, Constitution was written, and the first act was for the, uh, uh, for the government to write the rules about gold and silver being legal tender. You know, they had this old-fashioned idea that uh, you shouldn't counterfeit. You couldn't, shouldn't counterfeit government paper, and you shouldn't counterfeit government money. And anybody that did, uh, they thought it was so serious back then that they, they invoked the death penalty for the counterfeiters back then. So I don't know uh, whether you want to go that far or not. <laughs> <laughs> But, but we, we have this problem now about the counterfeiters because, uh, if, unless we reverse uh, Bernanke's belief that, uh, he, he, he says that gold is not money and only paper is money. So they are official counterfeiters and I've actually told them that <laughs> at the time. But once again, it's going to be an understanding that system is going to fail and we're going to have an opportunity to have a new monetary system. I just hope we do a good job, uh, like maybe turning it over to the marketplace and making sure nobody commits fraud. Leave it to the government. Guess what? People in government commit fraud, you know, and things like that. So, uh, yes, but I think the penalty is going to be, uh, you know, an intellectual answer to it by just uh, revoking their ability to do what they're doing. And uh, I think I think that day will come. On the other hand, if you do want to engage in a citizen's arrest, the rule of thumb is the citizen has to witness the person commit the crime in order to justify the arrest. So get yourself over there the next time they sign away our liberties. <laughs> Ron, I was just, I was just going to say that uh, all your hearings with with Greenspan over the years, all your instructions that you gave him may be starting to have an effect. I don't know if you heard this, but he gave an address at the Council on Foreign Relations a couple days ago, and he said, uh, the only real currency is gold. No fiat currency, including the dollar, can come close. So they actually deleted that from the transcript. They took it out of the video, and all we have is an audio of his saying that. Wait, you, know, you know, this raises the question of whether or not uh, Greenspan told me the truth many years ago. Because we were having a, uh, a hearing, but prior to the hearing, we were invited to have a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with the chairman. And uh, it was sort of scheduled, so I knew about it. And I thought, well, I, I think, you know, because most people know about uh, Gold and, and Freedom, the article he wrote in 1966 for uh, the Objectivist Newsletter for Rand, Ann Rand. So I dug that up because I just happened to subscribe to Rand's newsletter back then. And, and uh, so I took it up, and it was an old faded green uh, newsletter. So I took it in, and as we were sitting down there to chat for a few minutes, I, I asked him, I showed him the color, and I said, do you recognize what this is? He said, yeah, I, I know what that is. So I opened it up to the Golden Freedom uh, article, which was a fantastic article. Everything is correct. <laughs> and I said, do you remember this article? He says, yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, uh, and I, so I asked him, uh, I said, if, uh, I said, would you sign it for me? So he, 
So he autographed this article, and I said, do you want to put a disclaimer on it? <laughs> and his answer, now this is the important thing, his answer was, no, he says, I had just read this not too long ago, and I fully endorsed all the arguments in there. So now what Lou is saying, is sounding like the old Alan Greenspan. <laughs> so, we'll see. <laughs> This question is for Dr. Paul. Um, I have to confess, in 2008, I was completely ignorant. I didn't know anything about the monetary system. I didn't even know what the Federal Reserve was. Of course, I'm a perfect product of the California government school system, all the way through my structural engineering degree from Cal Poly. But learning about all this, and largely thanks to the Mises Institute and all of you gentlemen up there, has completely changed my thinking on everything. So my question for you is this. You spent all those years in Congress. How many of those supposed representatives of the people understand what the Federal Reserve is, what's happening, what the, everything that's going on? How many of them understand that, or are they just ignorant, or is it something far worse? Well, there's, prob there's probably about 10. <laughs> Five, and about seven of them understand it and why they have to defend it because that's how they run wars and the welfare state and they know exactly why they believe in the Federal Reserve and then there's three or four or five that are on our side and they understand it clearly but uh, no not too many do but it, it is changing mainly because people like you have changed your mind and you've gotten wind of the corruption through the monetary system so it uh, outside of Washington it is growing and that's where it's necessary and and they talk about the Fed now, and actually, uh, because of this, these changes, uh, it was something that I had worked on since the 70s. Uh, back then, it was uh, Henry Gonzalez in Texas, the populist liberal Democrat that wanted an audit of the Fed. So that was when I first got active in that. And Wright Patman, another populist Democrat, always wanted to open up the, uh, open up the banking system. So, uh, but, but, uh, that has floated. I kept working on it, but it wasn't until the 08 campaign because of these various educational activities and the college kids uh, waking up to this that uh, through the effort, through the Campaign for Liberty, an organization we have, we lobbied, you know, and got information to the members, and they brought it up twice, and both times it passed overwhelmingly in the House with strong bipartisan support. So it was a good example of how if views change, they're not just partisan, and they bring together both liberals and Democrats to have monetary reform. And so we're making a lot of progress on on that. But we, uh, but they'll be tenacious though when it comes to it. But basic understanding of the I don't know the exact number, but there aren't that many that really understand exactly how the Fed works. I think the uh, crisis helped get the attention because we were able to dig out some figures to show that the Fed was probably involved with anywhere between 13 and 15 trillion dollars in churning that money to bail out all their friends and the average people are starting to get wind of this so uh, i think we're making good progress on that issue ron if, if you'll recall ron there was a uh, a uh, congresswoman from the empire state who shall remain nameless who uh, sat on the banking committee with you and once asked you came up to you after a hearing and asked you said oh, i thought we were still on a gold standard you mean we're not on a gold standard <laughs> But it's okay because she was just on the banking committee. True story. <laughs> Shall rename nameless. And as far as I know, still in Congress. Yes. Still there. <laughs> Protecting the value of the dollar. <laughs> uh, my name is Bill Blair, and I have a question for the judge. Um, today we've spoken a lot about liberty and Jeffersonian uh, philosophy of government. Could you tell us uh, how you feel uh, jury nullification uh, might help us or you know, move us toward a freer society? Well, I, I, I'm personally all in favor of jury nullification, and I'm personally in favor of the judge informing the jury that they can nullify the prosecution. What you, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, jury nullification often occurs where the, defend, the evidence of guilt is strong enough to convict but the jury is of the view that the person ought never to have been prosecuted, and that the government was wrong to prosecute this person for violating this statute uh, under this uh, time. Uh, there are many, many historical examples of this. The Constitution of the State of New Hampshire 
compels judges to inform juries that they have the right to uh, nullify. Uh, when, when you think about it, the 12-person jury is itself a bulwark against tyranny, as long as they are truly free to vote their consciences. They, it, it might be necessary to inform them that they are truly free to say, even though the defendant performed these acts, he should be declared not guilty because the government had no bring, business bringing this prosecution. I wish every judge would say that to every jury. Dr. Paul, we're all very appreciative of your political work in Congress and uh, especially in your efforts to end the Fed, the mechanism that their state is using to put their hands in everyone's pockets and do whatever they want. So ending that would be a great benefit. But since it's been so difficult politically, do you see any ulterior or any alternative ways of ending the Fed perhaps or maybe even use, do you have any opinion on the use of Bitcoin to go about and end the Fed? Well, I think the uh, Fed probably will do more to end the Fed than anybody else, <laughs> because I think it's a non-viable system, and finally it'll just collapse, and the big question is, what will, what will they do for monetary reform? But although right now, you know, the dollar is up and people think that uh, it'll be salvaged forever and ever, I don't happen to believe that because uh, of, of, of how much uh, credit and money they're creating. So I think that will finally end, uh, but... Uh, there will be a replacement. The freer the society is and the more options and the more choice you have on currencies, I believe in uh, competing currencies, and, and I believe that uh, if, uh, if Bitcoin uh, satisfies people and there's no commitment of fraud by doing it, it may well be a participant. But uh, quite frankly, I have, uh, I have a political opinion and a personal opinion. My political opinion is very, very clear. Uh, no fraud. The government should butt out and they shouldn't touch it and let you do what you want. But uh, I'm still old fashioned enough that I like to uh, see real money that I would jingle in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> question is for Lou and for Dr. Paul. Um, I would describe myself as a pretty hardcore libertarian, and I read LouRockwell.com every day, and I'm familiar with the writings of like Lawrence Vance and, and yourself, where you say, don't vote, don't vote. And there are some very articulate arguments for not voting. Well, I do participate in the system. I ended up running for office, and I ended up winning. So my question is for libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, which is the, the best way to hasten the big correction, to bring about the demise of, of the Leviathan? Is it, is it by not voting and participating, which most people don't, or is it by getting anarcho-capitalists and libertarians to run for office like Dr. Paul has done uh, to, to change the beast from within? So is it, is it to participate or to not? Well, obviously, uh, people know what I have done, and um, but... The one, one thing is, is what people do is okay with me. <laughs> so if somebody doesn't like to vote or think it does any good and they choose to vote by not voting, that's okay. But I, I still think that uh, the, if you're in the uh, process that it is totally worthless and it's a very negative thing if you don't have somebody believing in something and you're doing it for that purpose. Because if uh, when I first went to Congress uh, in the 70s, if I decided, you know what, I really want to be chairman of the Financial Services Committee because I'll be a powerful person. And then you look at the system and how you do that is you play ball. Uh, you vote you vote with the leadership. You go in leadership, and then you follow some zombie who's the leader. <laughs> and, then, and then you then you get promoted, and you raise a lot of money, and you buy it. You know, a chairmanship uh, might cost today. It might be ten, eleven, twelve million dollars. You know, you have to raise to buy that buy that seat. Now, if that's the goal, I think the electoral process is is terrible. But if it's a place where you can use it. Uh, as a bully pulpit and, uh, and, and set a standard, I think it's worthwhile because quite frankly, by going there, I, uh, first, uh, never thought I was going to be elected at the beginning. I always tell the story that when I told Carol I was going to run, she said, why would you want to do anything like that? And she, she says, well, it's so dangerous. <laughs> I said, how can it be dangerous? She said, you'll probably win. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I guaranteed her that, you know, that that wouldn't happen. <laughs> But, uh, but if the goal is, like I told the young people, if that is your goal just to be in office, you lose sight of it. And then you say, how do I raise the money and how do I organize? How do I build these coalitions? So I didn't expect much to happen. Then I thought, well, if I vote the way I said, there's no way I'm going to get reelected. <laughs> so, you know, in the, in the early years, I, well, the whole time I had always vote against every, every bill that actually was beneficial to the district. And they had every opportunity in the world to throw me out. So uh, if I would have stayed and promoted and stayed in office and became a chairman by doing exactly the opposite, then I think the political process is is uh, very bad. Uh, but uh, so therefore, I would say that uh, those of you who want to run, uh, I would like to see a certain target and a certain goal. If you're supporting somebody, Find out what they believe in and uh, see if you can trust them and see if you agree with what they believe in. The big problem there is everybody will tell you what they believe in if they know who you are and they think you're going to be the best champion in the world. But I could always tell within a week I helped different members to get in, within a week I could tell whether they have joined a gang or not because they want their political assignments and they want uh, something for their district. And it, as far as I was concerned, it was over. So, but I think that's an individual thing. If somebody say, that's too much, that's, that's too much to think about. I'm just not going to vote. So <laughs> let's see what Lou has to say here. Well, uh, yeah, I don't vote. And, uh, uh, but I, if somebody enjoys voting, if they, if they, you know, I, I wouldn't tell them not to do it. Uh, I, I, I think in general it doesn't, you know, doesn't do any good. Uh, and they, uh, you know, the it's very important to the regime that you vote. They really care that people vote. You're, you're demonized if you're a non-voter. Uh, so that alone gives you some guidance that maybe as to what you should do or what you shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we could say there are many things that set Ron Paul apart, make him unique. Talk about his character, his vast knowledge, uh, his intelligence, his background, uh, and all that, you know, many, many other uh, wonderful virtues we could talk about. But to me, the reason he's really been unique in the history of American politics, he doesn't have power lust. He doesn't actually want to run anybody else's life, let alone the next country or the world or whatever, like most of these guys. So... Uh, if, you, if you're like that, by all means run for office, and it can be, a, as he's shown, it can be a great educational platform if you're inclined to that, if you have the talent for it, uh, and if you don't have power lust, yeah, go to it. Question, where's our next question? This gentleman. Uh, this last week, defending myself for not voting on Tuesday, and so I wondered if, Lou, you could address... Um, Perhaps if you were sitting across the table from Bill O'Reilly and he was giving you all of his best arguments in front of, you know, the nation, uh, why to vote? Why would you? What's your hardest hitting message against voting? And no offense to that's, the people who do run for office. Assuming he wouldn't cut the mic off, which is yeah. his normal practice one, yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd say your vote doesn't count. I mean, unless the election is decided by one vote, it doesn't matter whether you voted. As an individual, it doesn't matter whether you voted or not. Um, I would say also the, the you know the vote is the sort of the sacrament of the state religion. Uh, I'm a non-communicant. Um, <laughs> and again, it's just very very important to the regime that you do this, so that again, ought to you know obviously that doesn't persuade a Bill O'Reilly of anything, but uh, uh, this year there were um, uh, only a third of the potential voters voted. This has been the lowest in quite a long time. It's, you know, our, our, our non-voting party is expanding. <laughs> and I think that, you know, these people are again demonized as being uh, um, lazy, stupid. Um, they they're, uh, don't care about their neighbor. They don't care about the future and all that sort of thing. But I, when I find, when I talk to people who are non-voters, even if they're not sophisticated people, they, they'll say things like, well, they're all crooks. It doesn't matter if it's crook, this crook, or that crook. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, unless Ron Paul's running, right? Then it's a different, different story. But uh, since there's only been one Ron Paul in 200 years, I'm not waiting around for uh, more of them.
Uh, my question is for Mr. Gordon. Um, there's been an, a lot of attempts over the years to codify Western thought, and whether it's Mortimer Adler's great books and Synopticon and all that. I was wondering if you can point us to a resource that has attempted that with thought, liberty thought, or maybe plans to write something like that. Well, uh, on uh, attempts to codify thought, I tend to think those haven't been too successful. The basic thing is you just have to read as much as possible of the sources. I don't think there's you should let some kind of uh, someone else's ideas go come between you and the sources. You know, when they had the French Encyclopedia the, in the in, in the late 18th century, the idea they had was they were going to destroy all previous books and they would have, just in the encyclopedia, would have all the knowledge that people would need. I don't think that's been very successful. So <laughs> I think you just really have to read as much of the sources as you can. Uh, Jeff, in the vein of reframing the debate, do you think it would be a useful reframing if instead of using the term a stateless society, we use the term a state-free society? Well, I mean, language matters, clearly. Semantics matters. And, and I have seen a comment, I think it was just a random kind of comment online one time that said, you know, anarcho-capitalism, it's almost two words that both have in, have very negative connotations for a lot of people. I mean, that that's that's just the reality. And and coming from as as Mises did, for, you know, born before World War One and coming out of Europe in the late 1800s, uh, there, there's a there were vast generations of people for whom the term anarchism meant left wing anarchism. It meant Bolshevism. It meant bomb throwing, not sort of peaceful uh, voluntarism. So it, you know, it's it's been a loaded term, and it's something we have to fight. Um, you know, on the one hand, I hate to, to almost seem dishonest by trying to use uh, f more flowery language that's not as honest or as accurate as it might be. But, uh, you know, your point is well taken. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think the term is going to continue to evolve. I think libertarianism is, is uh, slowly being supplanted. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But um, I, I will say this. It's something we should all give a lot of thought to because semantics do matter. We have time for one more. Hi, uh, Lou or, uh, or Jeff. Y you guys uh, put on a lot of educational seminars, Mises University, and so on and so forth. Has there ever been any thought given to the idea of eventually conferring degrees? Um, you know, the, the uh, state... Education complex, of course, wants to control that very much. But you already see uh, private accreditation of sort existing in the marketplace with certain uh, tech certificates that you can get that are, you know, you can become Microsoft certified. Microsoft isn't a school per se. It's not um, uh, certified by any uh, state or federal accreditation board. But uh, nonetheless, a Microsoft certification matters. So I, I could very much see us going in that direction where you can get a, a, a Mises certification. Yeah, and Guido Holzman once did a study of this for us, and uh, the, the regulations in Alabama to be a degree-granting institution in the normal sense are just, as Jeff mentioned, just uh, crazy. I mean, in terms of the number of faculty you have to have and many, many other very expensive things. But uh, uh, we've thought of an eventually maybe granting degrees if that's possible. It's also possible to grant uh, things that are not, the government doesn't consider degrees like a, a, a diploma or a licentiate uh, in Austrian economics. So yeah, I think that's, if we have the support, we, we would be very interested in doing something like that. Absolutely. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude for the day. The bookstore will be open for a while, and uh, we'd love to see all of you on the West Coast at an event next year. Thank you so much for coming. It means the world to us.